Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. We're thrilled today to have with us an expert panel, as well as um, Jason Jardine. Jason Jardine is with Kenobi Martins. He is an AZ Bio board member, and he has the honor of being the last presenter at AZ Bio Peers when we did them in person. The pandemic changed our format. And today we do our AZ Bio Peer sessions on Zoom so that they are more accessible to people across the state of Arizona. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Jason Jardine. And Jason, um, please introduce your panel and get us started. All right, will do. Um, it's nice to uh, be here with everybody today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about licensing. And in light of uh, uh, Halloween, we're going to try and take the spooky out of licensing uh, a, a little bit. Um, so our agenda today is to uh, have some introductions of each other. And then we'll talk about what it means or how we go about attracting licensees to our technology and how we build an IP portfolio that's worthy of licensing and, and what uh, IP uh, diligence uh, for licensing or acquisition looks like. Um, now you'll notice during the course of this discussion that um, some of the answers to questions in some sections will apply to other sections as well. There's a lot of crossover between these, these uh, each of these sections. But first, let's talk about who we've got here. So here, here is um, our panel. Our panel includes um, my partner, Jane Dye, who is with law firm of Kenobi Martins Olson and Bear. Uh, she's a patent attorney. Her practice is focused on pharmaceuticals and biotechnologies. Um, she's a believer that successful IP strategies must support the underlying business objectives of the clients. Um, she, she works with individual inventors, academic institutions, venture startups, or even publicly traded companies. Uh, she's helped clients build commercially valuable patent portfolios in, in many countries, up to 50 or 60 countries and regions. And she holds PhD from Penn State, um, in organic chemistry and JD from UC Berkeley. Kyle. Uh, Seagal is the current executive director, uh, chief patent counsel for Skysong Innovations at ASU. He works primarily with life science innovations and, and inventions. He's a registered patent attorney, holds degrees from USC and Johns Hopkins University and University of Arizona. And prior to joining Skysong, he practiced law, helping clients uh, getting all types of intellectual property rights. Um, some of those clients were large Fortune 500 companies, others were small startups. Um, Stefan Johnson is a serial entrepreneur and is current CEO of Calviri. That's a biotech company uh, developing a vaccine for cancers in humans and other mammals. Uh, he was a founder of a number of different companies pri uh, prior to this one, including Synbody uh, biotechnology and health tell. He's director of ASU's Biodesign Institute Center for Innovations in Medicine and professor of the school uh, in the School of Life Sciences. He's published extensively, um, lots of papers and and patents. Prior to his appointment at ASU, he was professor and director of the Center for Biomedical in Inventions at UT Southwestern Medical Center and professor of biology and medical uh, biomedical engineering at Duke University. He's a member of the National Academy of Inventors and Dr. Johnson received his BS and PhD degrees from University of Wisconsin. Welcome to our panel. Uh, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is a little bit uh, of a discussion about how to attract licensees. And Skysong Innovations is a, uh, an entity that was created separate from uh, ASU, uh, but it's kind of a, an outside council tech transfer office, outside tech transfer office for ASU. It's acting as a, a, a proxy tech transfer for ASU, um, which 
uh, we believe increases flexibility um, and speed in dealing and deal making and venturing activities. And with the support of this entrepreneurial arm at Skysong, ASU has become one of the top performing U.S. universities in terms of intellectual property inventions, um, and both for for disclosures and also for granted patents. Um, ASU, for the last number of years, has been one of the top universities in the country um, in, in these uh, areas. Skysong's facilitated the launch of over 230 startups and advancing ASU technologies, which have collectively raised more than uh, $1.3 billion in external funding and generated more than $2 billion in economic impact in Arizona. So we're very grateful for Skysong Innovations. Now, um, Kyle, Tell us a little bit about how it is that Skysong functions and how you, you go about um, selecting inventions to try and protect. Our organization uh, handles a very diverse portfolio of technologies coming out of the university. Everything from cybersecurity to biotech and everything in between. So our strategy has to be able to adapt to that kind of diversity. Um, when we look at technologies, our, our our internal process is very geared towards giving every technology a chance to make it into the marketplace. So we place a heavy emphasis on initial patent filings to protect the technologies, and we file those fairly liberally. And then we conduct strategic marketing campaigns for each technology that we file on. So that's that's a custom marketing campaign where we are identifying it could be 20 to 50 companies, for example, in a specific niche market and individually reaching out to um, officers and principals in those organizations about the technologies. We'll prepare non-confidential summaries. So write-ups of you know, what the technology is in terms of really what it does, not, not the secret sauce, but what is, what is the problem that it solves um, and, and ultimately, how does it achieve an outcome without getting into confidential details? So we'll reach out to companies in that regard. That's kind of a primary strategy for attracting licensees, but another really important one that I think is actually even more important for perhaps folks in our audience that are in startups is interacting broadly with investor communities. Investor communities are critical for uh, being able to essentially serve as honeybees for you. Um, any any startup company, any established company that's going to take a license from you is probably going to have to get some sort of approval to enter into that sort of transaction. Its board is likely going to be involved, especially at the startup stage. The board is going to be influenced by investors who have seats. So as a result, investors are great resources for understanding which technologies might be applicable to other companies in their portfolio. So if you can build those relationships and get in front of investors, not only for you know, fundraising purposes, but also thinking for downstream licensing opportunities, that can be really successful because maybe an investor is not ready to invest in your company, but maybe they actually have a portfolio company with some sort of you know, synergetic technology that later down the road, they think of you, they think back to when you pitch to them and they think, oh, you know what, this company actually might have something that can help us. So they can make some connections for you. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. So, so building the network is, as a, you know, has become more important or as important as, as initially trying to find uh, licensees. Now, now, in my experience, I've done a lot of, um, uh, I've been asked by clients, can you find a licensee for this particular technology? And I'll go searching around and find people in verticals or find various um, uh, potentials and, and reach out to those, those potential licensees. Now I find, it's been my experience that if the attorney gets involved in trying to do that, then they are less likely to be excited about it than if the CEO says, you know, reaches out. Um, how do you solve that problem, or, or or is that a problem for for Skysong? No, that that's a real thing, definitely. Um, we don't have attorneys reaching out to do our marketing or our business development. We have dedicated licensing and business development folks. So, in the context of a startup, again, if you're a small company and you have a technology that maybe is not your primary line of business, but you think there's a licensing opportunity, maybe in a field 
of use that you're not going to primarily commercialize. Let's say you were going after human health and your technology is also applicable to animal health, but you know your investors are really focused on human health. They don't want you distracted with the animal health business uh, for whatever reason. Maybe there's a sub-licensing opportunity for animal health. So in that case, definitely agree with Jason, having a business person be the first kind of point of contact is really important. When when lawyers get involved, people tend to clench up a little bit. And uh, that's not what you want, especially in the early phases of these discussions. Just getting your foot in the door to have a conversation is sometimes the hardest part. So if you want to remove all obstacles, try to get the path of least resistance, get your foot in the door. The lawyers can come later, help you transact in, in a proper way that sets everyone up for success but you don't want to go in with the lawyers. And I say that as a lawyer and of course, Jason's an attorney. We've got others online as well. Yeah. Steph, Stephan, what's been your experience? You, you, you've you actually licensed IP from Skysong. What's been your uh, experience uh, working with Skysong as a licensor? Yeah, uh, quite a bit. I, I'd first say relative to lawyers, I, I really feel sorry for them. It's the, it's the 99% of them that give the rest a bad name. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, but yeah, no, I've dealt with Kyle and, and Skysong quite a bit. I guess the, the maybe um, I really don't belong on an expert panel, but uh, one of the things that uh, I came up against was that that they Skysong is is flexible in terms of negotiations about that licensing. Um, so you you know you tend to think that universities are pretty set in their ways and they. Uh, you know, it's my way or the highway kind of attitude, which many of them have, by the way. Um, but uh, in dealing with particularly Skysong, but now with other universities, the um, they can be made more flexible than they appear at first. And a good example is, is that in licensing the technologies that went out to Calvary, uh, we struck a deal with uh, Skysong, which I believe was unique at the time, that instead of getting equity position in the company, we just had a, a flat a fee, a flat percentage that they would get off of any income we got from uh, liquidity events from the company that involved their, their technology. That was new, but it also has turned out to be quite useful because that uncomplicates dealing with investors in the future who tend to look at the university involvement as a complication, you know, because they're trying to protect their dilution and things like this. And so um, I was impressed that uh, the Sky Song was a lot more flexible than I thought they would be. Yeah, well, and, and that actually leads us nicely into how we, we go about building portfolios that are that are worthy of licensing. Um, and and Kyle talked briefly about protecting of inventions through patents and patent applications. And he said that they they cast a pretty wide net when they start before they, they start looking to see if there's interest in the particular technology. And they probably winnow it down a little bit after that. Um, uh, Jane, what? You know, very often a small company has a lot of ideas and how do you how do you help them decide on which ideas are worth uh, protecting and filing patents on? Uh, that, that's a really good question. It's in, important to take that first step. Right. So in how at what point you think you are you have come up with a great invention that that's worth um um, a patent protection, you know, that's a, that's actually a quite a hard question um, for uh, some of the inventors that, that's you know, not very patent or IP savvy. You know, there's uh, different ways of uh, protecting IP. So, you know, as uh, um, said here, there's trade secrets, patent, copyrights, and trademarks. So, I'm a I'm a patent attorney, so my I'm I will be focusing on talking about patents. So, um, most people have probably heard about the provisional applications you know you come up with idea you probably have some prototype you think oh maybe i i should write a patent on it you know you it doesn't have to be super polished you can write a provisional application and then you have 12 months to continue development and 12 months later and then you convert it to a non non-provisional application this is a very common path most people will take will be one provisional application and then 12 
months later to convert it to a non-provisional. But that's not the only path. And in particularly in uh, the pharmaceutical space, you rarely do that. Um, you know, for various considerations. So, you know, the, the most uh, important consideration is your priority date. So you come up with, you know, maybe you make five compounds, you put them in a provisional application, but throughout the year, you're continuing making new compounds. And then some of the compounds will fall outside the scope um, or, have, you know, have different structure than the five, you know, than the provisional application you filed. Uh, a couple months ago. So instead of waiting um, for 12 months and then file your non-provisional adding all your new compounds, you know, we often actually file um, a second provisional, a third provisional, which we, we call that uh, rolling provisionals. So in that way, you just continue capturing the, the new uh, invention you're making. And then by the end of the 12 months, then you have a very, very robust application that you can convert. That, that's also like a common path. And then the, there's a third one is, um, you know, your, com your invention might be quite complicated. You know, it has multiple parts and the, each part is, it's almost an uh, entirely standalone um, inventive concept. You know, you might not have 12 months to, you know, to perfect or improve on different parts of your invention. Then you might consider actually putting them into separate applications because they're not on all on the same development timeline. It might take you two, two years or three years to, you know, to perfect each of the parts. So we actually would also file a series of patent applications. You know, we, you know, we, for example, you know, the uh, antibody drug um, patent application, you know, you have your antibody, you have your linker, you have your wallhead, right? You might be, improving the linker, you could also making small changes to the wallhead. And those two are quite separate um, inventive concepts. So we don't necessarily have to put them all in one single application, you know, although there's the considerations, you know, uh, in particularly cost considerations to put them into a single application. But I think in, in this situation, it's actually better to put them into discrete separate applications. So you're not bound by the 12 months timeline. And so when I um, sit down with a prospective client or a client to talk about their invention, the first thing that I, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a serious converse conversation with them, ask them about the development timeline, what are you planning to do in the next 12 months? And then from that, then I decide, you know, what's the best approach for them. Yeah, and, and so do you ever consider, um patent term when you're filing so so for example if you, if you have a, a candidate compound that that makes it to the fda would you would you file first on that core technology and then maybe add additional inventions as they come up related to um may, maybe the formulation maybe methods of treatment maybe other things that you discover during those fda trials as you're 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 progressing yeah, absolutely. That's very, very common in the pharmaceutical space. You know, you you have your core invention, which we, we call a you know small molecule, a new chemical entity. And then of course you protect that one first. And that's also something that's very, very early in your, you know, in your research and development, right? You're doing compound screening and you identified a group of compounds which you further narrow down, select your lead compound. So, you know, but the the whole Development timeline is so long from, uh, you know, doing research in the lab till you get carry your first compound, your lead compound into um, clinical step, preclinical study, even like, you know, rats and dog study and into human. That's we're talking probably eight or 10 or even longer. And uh, you don't want to just have a single compound covering your invention because you want to have this um, what do we call life cycle management. Um, then you continue to file a new application uh, when you are at a different stage of your um, the the drug developments. You know, for example, once you before you start your phase one trial, there will be a typically a dose selection, right? So that'll be a separate application. And then once you go into formulation, you might you know have extended release or you know some delayed release 
proprietary formulation that will be another um, pattern. And oftentimes, you know, you would have your indication, you know, um, for for example, your cancer drug treating compound, your, your first indication will be treating some type of cancer. But you might also find that, you know, this drug could also be, um, you know, have some anti-inflammatory activity or some other activity. So we would also like to file, um, you know, second generation, the second medical use type of patent later on. So your drug could be, you know, used off label for some other purpose. Um, so also when you uh, further out, further along in your clinical development and there is a very specific type of patent we would write for you, it's called a label patent. Basically these patent tra tracks, what you envision, what would you put in your prescribing information once your drug is approved? And that's very important because all that ties to um, the FDA orange book listing. So, you know, you want to have multiple patents that listed uh, in the FDA orange book once your drug is approved because to prevent the um, generic pharmaceutical, you know, entry to make the, the generic version of your drug. So in also by doing that, you really, you're not talking about the one patent that's good for 20 years, you know, by the time, your drug is proved that you might be already, you have, you know, seven or eight years left. But if you keep continue to file these a series of new patent application, you could extend your your whole, you know, patent protection for 30, 40 years. Yeah, that's an excellent summary of how you how you envision uh, for a pharmaceutical or biotechnology, how, how you, you know, going in tandem with the FDA and making it through. Um, I've noted here on the slide that uh, you know a recent article that came from the EPO, uh, the European Patent Office, saying that startups with patents and trademarks are more successful, ten times more successful in securing funding. Um, in the United States, it's actually quite a bit higher than that. Um, you, you, these are these are essential things that you need when you when you have a small uh, 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 company. Um, Stefan, in, in you're you're in kind of a unique position because you've you've both licensed from and also licensed some of your technologies to other companies. Um, do you um, in all of your your in in preparing your portfolios in order to be licensed? What are some of the things that you've learned? So uh, it's interesting. Here's one anecdotal thing is that early on um, when we were filing, we were filing uh, worldwide patents, in, including in China. And, um, and I, when I was looking at this, uh, Chinese applications are fairly expensive and complicated to do. And it's a sort of a nebulous, even when we were looking at this in 2018, of what the protection will get us. Yet, Companies that we were talking to, large pharmaceuticals uh, or therapeutics, were very uh, concerned about our worldwide protection of things, including China. Um, and, but in 2018, as Jason knows, I, I, I did a, an assessment of the future of China, and I came to the conclusion that the economy was going to go downhill and it would become more dictatorial. And so we stopped filing patents and protecting patents in China based on that assessment. And and the rest is history. And I think you, as a as someone developing your patents and and thinking about patenting to other or licensing other people, you have to think for yourself. You can't just go with what everybody else says and and tells you to do, including even an expert like Jason. Um, you you have to um, kind of. Uh, Think about your own patent portfolio and think from first principles for yourself in terms of developing that portfolio. Um, I personally think that even though that number, I, I understand that number of 10 times more successful, I personally think that the, the companies that will come and do diligence on your, on your patents are not very good at it. Um, they tend to just sort of use these linear projections of your patents into the future. And even though you, there's another statistic that if a large number of startups, I forgot the exact number, 
What they make money on had nothing to do with the patents they originally had in their portfolio. So, but, you know, but if all you do is emphasize what you have in your portfolio then and now, not where it's going to go in the future, they'll probably miss that. And I think you probably have to educate them in that respect. Yeah. Um, and, and so let's, let's go back for just a minute. Um, Kyle, what are some, some mistakes that you have seen in, in trying to build a portfolio, an IP portfolio that, that somebody might want to license? One of the biggest mistakes that I see startups make in particular is actually not having a good understanding going in about the costs and the timelines associated with protecting technology through the patent system. A lot of times startups will fall into one of two traps when they're asked, okay, where do we want to protect this particular technology? Trap number one is let's file everywhere. Filing everywhere is extremely expensive. And before you know it, the startup is going to be saddled by a huge amount of patent expenses that don't really align with a clear business objective or strategy. And that's a problem. That's that's something that turns investors off. They don't want to come in and, and see first money go out the door to pay legal expenses or government filing fees. So you have to be really careful about where you choose to file, exactly like Stefan was saying, right? He made a strategic decision because of the cost, because of the complexity, probably because of the time it was taking him and his team as well. You have to think strategically about where you're going to do these things. The other side of the spectrum is also a trap, which is sometimes startups say, I'm just going to file in the U.S. and not worry about anything else. That is extremely risky, particularly in the bioscience space, because as Stefan said, investors, strategic partners, they're looking 10 years down the line when this drug is on the market and they want to be selling without generic competition into, into all the big economies around the world. So it's important to find a sweet spot in the middle where you're really, like Stefan said, you're thinking for yourself around where are the opportunities um, in the short term, but also 10 years from now when this drug is being sold, when this diagnostic is being sold, where are the, the main customer bases, where are the potential sites of manufacturer, um, how are the products going to flow distribution wise, um, does everybody in your niche ship through a particular channel? If so, you need to protect those particular channels. Um, do you need to file for protection in Morocco? Probably not, maybe in your case, but probably not. But a lot of times startups will take that approach. They just say, look, we need to file everywhere. Well, if you file everywhere in the Middle East, for example, you're going to add $50,000. Do you really need that? You know, or is it is it sufficient to go U.S., you know, Japan, uh, Europe, Canada, Australia, some of the bigger ones? So thinking strategically is really important. And so just to kind of reiterate the, the main point and the takeaway, patents are expensive. They are vital, but they are expensive. So you have to be careful and you have to understand the timelines going in. And related to the timelines, it's also important to understand how patent applications are either open or closed. They can be open in the sense that you can continue to seek new patent claims out of the, the technical description of the technology that you originally file. And that's really helpful because you don't know who your strategic partners are going to be at the time you file often. And so you want to give yourself optionality to pursue different types of patent claims, like Jane was saying, and set up a portfolio that, that allows uh, licensees and strategic partners and, and investors to have comfort that there's optionality for the unknown future that lies ahead. Patent applications can be closed, meaning you're pretty much stuck with whatever patent claims that you've already secured. Um, there's a certain timeline associated with when patents are open and closed, and that's controllable to an extent by working with your patent attorney and using special types of applications. So these things can become really important, and, and it is a trap for, for startups to, again, spend too much money, but also not understand how patent applications can be open and closed, because if you let a patent family, a group of patent applications close too early, for example, you may find yourself in a spot where somebody comes along who's interested in a license or partnering with you, um, or even there's an infringer on the market and your claims don't quite cover what's needed. And if that patent application had been open, you might have been able to refile a new application with some, some slightly different claims that are, are customized for that situation. So 
couple things that we see uh, startups run into. I really like that suggestion to use a uh, uh, wi you know, wise use of strategic continuations to make sure you still have optionality, you still have the opportunity. I also really like the, the advice of to be careful where you're filing because you want to file in the places that are important to your investors or that are important to your potential partners, but you don't want to overfile because it doesn't, it doesn't show good business acumen to your, your potential partners um, to do that. Um, and that leads us actually very nicely into the next slide, which is, well, what, what does diligence look like? What happens when the large company or the, the potential licensor comes to look at your portfolio and putting on my hat of, of a large company for just a minute, if when I come to, to look at your company, some of the things that I am going to ask for are, you know, I'm going to, to ask for you for a lot of information. I'm going to say, okay, I, I'm going to ask you for not in the pharma space, in, in the med device space, I would say, give me samples uh, or, or prototypes give me your marketing materials, give me your engineering drawings, instructions for use of all the current and proposed company products. Now that's, that's a little different than, than pharma and biotech because you, you don't have those things and you're way too early for marketing. But but in a, we, we have some folks here that are part of the med device space. Um, so I need to, to mention that. I would also ask for a list of all of the US patents and, and all pending US applications, all issued foreign patents and pending foreign applications that are currently owned by or licensed to the company. I'd like um, the company to identify which of those uh, are, are the key patents and the applications that exclude the competition or that cover the, the company's products. And I'd also like them to identify to me any known or possible infringers of those patents. And then I would do my my own uh, determination of how um, how accurate is that analysis that they're giving me. Um, but I would want all of that. Um, I would also ask them to identify uh, or, or provide me copies of correspondence with the Patent and Trademark Office um, filed or received in connection with patents. So file histories if it's not publicly available. Um, Stopping here for just a minute uh, on, on my list, Jane, what are some, some cost-effective measures that can be taken in the event that there are multiple companies, multiple big companies that are doing diligence on your, uh, on your client, on your small company? I mean, you know, uh, going down the list, you just talk about that's a lot of uh, information and the material to be collected. So your first uh, due diligence, um, you know, um, unfortunately, is going to be, uh, you know, a really big undertaking, you know, because you, you know, start from zero, you don't have any of these lists or samples. So we, you know, what we can help is maybe help you have a list of your pattern and help you um, prepare like a pattern family tree. And have you prepare a slide deck, you know, and talk about each of your patent families. And, uh, you know, we could even talk about what due diligence or what, you know, landscape search you have done, whether you have any, um, you know, third party, you know, patent analysis and all that. So, it, you know, that first pass is going to take a lot of efforts. But once you have that, you know, a, Big companies tend to ask almost exactly the same questions. So once you have your first slide deck, you have your, all your materials together, and then going to your second, your third, due diligence is much easier because they tend to ask exactly the same question. They ask for, you know, what are your patents? You know, ask about patent ownership and assignment, ask about um, any of the, uh, you know, potential infringers. So by then you've already have all the, all your, you know, answers prepared and uh, you know for oftentimes you know if you have already done a say um market clearance or you know third party landscape search even if you've done it two years ago and two years later you have another company ask you whether you've done it before you know it you don't have to do another one you can tell them that i've done it two years ago is it good enough and then let them come back to you they might say okay that's good enough you don't do you don't have to do a new one so 
So all these things, you know, once you have, you know, have done your first one, I think your first, your second and third one is going to be a lot easier if you have, you know, a good document management system, you know, keeping everything together. Yeah, Stefan, you've done this multiple times. Do you keep a data room open with all of this stuff populated in a data room? Yeah, the the companies usually require that or prefer that, so we 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 um, give them access to that. I guess one of the things I was surprised at in the diligence, I haven't done this extensively, only a few times, but is that they were at least in one two cases. The um, companies uh, were using that, uh, their interpretations to devalue you. And so, um, you know, it's a, a competitive advantage of theirs to say why they shouldn't pay as much as you're asking. And um, and so you just have to be prepared for that, that uh, to be uh, ready for a defensive response. Yeah, and in, in some cases, companies have already made the decision that they're going to acquire you or they're going to license from you. And so they're only negotiating the price or they're only trying to figure out, well, what is it that we're actually buying here? <laughs> um, what, are we, you know, what are we getting into? But in other cases, they are doing diligence to try and make the decision, yes, we do want to get, uh, get involved and yes, we do want to do a deal. They haven't made that decision yet. So, so they come to it with different perspectives. Um, uh, Kyle, how how long do you typically see that the diligence process takes in order to get from from first meeting to signing a deal? It it can vary. It really depends on how prepared both sides are. If if the potential licensor of a startup company in this example takes the time to do the things that that Jane has recommended here and that it's Stefan has described. You set up a data room, you, you keep it up to date. Those things are really important for interacting with particularly strategic partners. We talk about licensing here and that can mean different things. Um, strategic partners, licensing technology are really looking down the road to acquisition typically. And that's why you have this more rigorous diligence process. It can be easily six months. I mean, I've seen diligence last a year. It just depends on um, how the two sides are interacting. <clears throat> we had one startup company um, in diligence with a very, very large multi-billion dollar leader in a particular field. And I guess this is another thing to bear in mind. Some of those big companies can move very slowly. So you have to be, you have to be patient. You have to be um, persistent. Don't give up hopes, you know, stay focused. You're going to have a lot of other things going on. You're trying to develop the technology. You're trying to run a team. You're trying to potentially raise more money, all sorts of things you're trying to do um, while you are in diligence. So you've got to keep your, your head in the game, potentially for the long term. Um, but I think if you can do that and you can stay focused and organized, you can get to that finish line. Just know that sometimes, especially the bigger the company, the longer it can take because there's there's more bureaucracy, there's more people that are involved. In one example, we got all the way to the finish line and right at the finish line, the and this was a huge company, Fortune 500 company, the CEO of the company changed and the entire deal was killed at the 11th hour because the, CEO, the new CEO came in and said, you know what, I need some time to understand everything that's going on. And so it was put on pause and pause became, you know, six months became a year became now we've just moved on. So, um, you know, you, you've got to keep your head in the game and stay focused, do what you can to keep things moving, because, the you know, there's a phrase time kills deals. So keep things moving as much as you can, but just know that, you know, if it stretches out, don't lose hope and don't lose focus. Um, you got to get to that finish line and do what you can. Yeah, I also, I also just quickly say from the from the university licensing side, if you're licensing technology uh, from a university, then those deals can be closed much more quickly. We, we're not going through this kind of process on the screen here. Um, this process that is on the slide is is really what you should expect if you're a, you know in the bioscience space, you're going to be licensed entering licensing transactions or strategic partnerships um, with, you know, with larger companies. 
in the university space, we can do deals, you know, in a couple of weeks potentially, but bear in mind that the technology at that point is much, much earlier in the process. So uh, there just simply isn't a whole lot of these facts even surrounding it yet, which is why we don't get into them. So I, did, I just, just want to kind of draw that distinction. Yeah, the, the kind of diligence that people are coming to the university to do is going to be a little bit different than this. This is the kind you want to prepare for mm -hmm. as, you know, with the larger uh, partners as, as you're as you're going. And and one one of the things that's important on this slide and near, near the bottom is related to and, and a lot of this diligence is trying to figure out what does your company own and, uh, you know, can you, you know, and what and what does it cover? So so how strong is that and what, what it covers? But the ownership inquiry is is particularly important when you when you have a startup and and startups have people who come into the company and who leave the company and who who um, uh, sometimes don't sign their assignments or other other documents and and it becomes a little bit of a problem to make sure that you can prove ownership of, of um, patents and applications and other intellectual property. And, and so, you know, I have a little bit of a plug here for making sure that you have employment agreements or, or founding agreements in place with, with small companies. Um, may, Jane, do you want to talk about that a little bit? How, how ownership can foul up a deal and how, how you can maybe do things uh, to, to make sure that um, you get all of the rights to the invention? Sure, sure. You know, ownership is such an important question. Without a fail, every single due diligence I've been through, that's one of the top three questions they would ask if you have ownership to the patents in your, in your portfolio. So, you know, my advice is to everyone is to just get that assignment in place as early as possible. Don't wait till the last minute, you know, when, you know, when you're in front of a due diligence, upcoming due, due diligence. So, you know, there's a, you know, the pattern, uh, you know, ownership can be established by, you know, if there is no assignment in place, then it's uh, owned by all the inventors, right? So it's a pretty straightforward if you have, if you have a um, application and then all the inventors are, are your employees, then you can have just a, a very straightforward assignment document and have that recorded as early as possible before anybody leave the company um or you know you know or you couldn't find them anymore but i think it gets more complicated is when you have inventors that are not part of the company they're not company employees they come in as um you know maybe an expert as our contract the research lab that they they come and help certain aspects of your um, invention, you know, that happens very often in startups because you don't have all the manpower to do everything in house. Oftentimes you have to contract certain part of your, um, you know, development out to uh, to the contractor. So they are not your employee. They don't have any obligation to assign. So, you know, that's why it's important in your consulting agreements, uh, some sort of uh, any of a master service agreement you want to have the clause talking about IP ownership to make sure, you know, even though they might, they are not, a, they're not your employee, they don't have an obligation to assign to you, but they are obligated to assign the work that you contract them to do. And I've actually had a one, an, one, one instance that uh, um, because of a not great um, assign, um, assignment, we, you know, the deal didn't it kind of fell through, you know, it could be multiple reasons, but I think this is one of the the, the reasons the, the, the other side, they keep coming back to us. So we have one um, contractor, he's a, a CEO of a different company, but then he was um, one of the inventors um, on one of our applications. So um, by the time we, you know, it's time to record an um, application, he has already left the company, um, left the, his, uh, his contract term has ended, so we couldn't find him. We keep um, trying to contact him, ask him to um, assign to, to to sign the assignment document, but we just never could reach him. So we ended up using his uh, um, his uh, uh, I guess a contract consulting agreement. We recorded that 
with the USPTO. And then the USPTO said, okay, they, they don't really look at language. So we were able to get assignment in place by simply recording his uh, consulting agreements. But when it comes time to do due diligence, the, the other side, they actually looking through the consulting agreement and uh, pointing out that the consulting agreement actually has no language about IP ownership. So in the other side, their, their opinion is this consulting agreement is actually defective in terms of uh, IP ownership. It's not clear at all whether you know, the, the person has any obligation to assign to you. Even we have unilaterally uh, um, assigned the, uh, uh, sorry, recorded the um, assignment document. It was considered to be deficient um, by the other side. So that was the one of the main reasons, you know, could be one of the several reason that um, they decided to walk away. So we, you know, so the lesson is that, you know, if you, you have filed the application, just try to chase down every inventors as early as possible um, to get them to sign. And then if they are not your employee, try to um, build in those language, very specific language in your consulting agreement that to make it very clear that you own the IP. No, that's some very good advice. Um, uh, Kyle, what what's uh, you you have some comments there, or do you have some uh, comments on on what mistakes people often make? Yeah, I, I just wanted to give a very real example of this issue in in a slightly different category of issues, which is assignments. In addition to being important to establish ownership for purposes of diligence and and conveying confidence to an acquirer that you're actually able to hand over these assets that they're paying for, they can also be extremely important in the patenting process. And a, a famous example recently was in the in the CRISPR battles in Europe. Uh, the Broad Institute had a problem with some of their assignments from inventors, and it actually caused them to lose some priority rights in Europe, which then led to some of their uh, some of their key patents being uh, invalidated. So something that seems like it's a formality can actually play a really big uh, role downstream if you don't kind of do things correctly. So just another example in the real world where it's CRISPR, it's a, it's a story we're all familiar with. Um, it actually impacted at least the Broad Institute to a degree in the past you know, five years or so. Yeah. And because those license, those assignments, if I remember correctly, because they were not in place by the, at the time that the application was filed, that's what destroyed the priority claim. Um, so, so um, uh, Kyle, is there there? Um, what's what's a, another example of an incorrect statement you hear people make when they enter a licensing negotiation? One of the statements <clears throat> that we sometimes hear is, "Investors won't invest in my company unless I own." the IP that you're trying to license to me. And that's, <clears throat> it's certainly important for your company to own the IP developed by its employees. Going back to Jane's statements a moment ago, that's critical. But you can license in technologies, particularly on an exclusive basis. And that can be done effectively and in the right way, such that you'll have no problem raising money. Is it, is it cleaner and preferable to own title to a techno? Absolutely, no question. But that's not always a deal you're going to be able to negotiate with the party that holds those rights. They're going to want some level of assurance that they participate in downstream benefits in exchange for get, you know, giving you the technology, essentially. Um, so that's one statement we sometimes hear that can lead to delays in negotiations. Um, going round and round over well, can we actually assign this and transfer title to the technology? Do we want to do that? It can sometimes just simply not be worth it because in an exclusive license agreement, you can effectively grant to the licensee all the rights that an owner would essentially have, the right to enforce the patents, the right to you know control patent prosecution, the right to choose counsel in various situations. And really the relationship can be more focused on a flow back of consideration to the technology owner in the form of royalties or fees or what have you. Um, but you can effectively position the licensee to have all the rights that they would need as if they were an owner. Um, so that's that's a statement that we do run into that 
is is not really correct. Yeah. Yeah, that bundle of sticks, you know, you you need to, to have enough of them so that you can actually do what you want to do and control it. But you don't, you don't, but ownership does not, is, is not uh, a requirement. Um, well, you know, let's see, why don't we conclude with some pro tips and then we'll, then we'll take some questions here. Um, here's just a few tips. Um, so we want to build your IP portfolio, think about it. In, in in preparation for the diligence, what's that gonna look like? And and whether that diligence is for licensing or is it for an acquisition of your company, either way, you wanna build your, your IP portfolio, keeping that in mind. And then periodically, you should make sure and align your IP with the core uh, uh, of your technology. Um, maybe some patents that you initially file, like Stefan mentioned, are no longer as important later on in the process. And, and so we shouldn't spend as much money on them. Um, maybe some become more important. And then we you should periodically consider updating your searching on your core patents and applications. Those are both uh, uh, for landscape freedom operate type searching and also for patentability searching to make sure uh, that they are as robust as they can be, because you will get questions about that during diligence. Um, you should review your portfolio, potential licensees or targets, and make sure you align your markets as best you can. Now, maybe you, if you have a pharmaceutical, uh, your, your, um, uh, you, you don't have the money as your small company to file in all the markets that, that um, uh, the big company, the, the, the Roche or the Pfizer or the whoever, uh, Santa Fe is going to want to uh, control, but you 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 hit the major ones. So they and and don't try and and be something that you're not because your your company is small and their companies are big. Um, and then last, I, I would just make sure to secure and maintain copies of employment agreements, but also get those assignments in place uh, as early as possible. Um, here, let's take a look at some of the uh, chat questions, um, if we have a couple. Um, so, uh, Robert, uh, what are the risks of handing over prototypes and drawings to an interested party? My counsel seems worried the potential buyer will steal my technology my board told me to engage and see if the buyer is serious and potentially get a price they'd be willing to pay. That's a very good question. You're going to want to turn those over. If they're, if you've already filed for, for patent applications on the, the your device, then I wouldn't worry about that at, at all. And um, likely you you have some sort of an NDA or, or initial agreement with the, uh, the diligence company and, and so again, that would not concern me about turning those those kinds of things over. Um, Stefan, have you ever been asked those kinds of questions on on any of your uh, IP that you were concerned about turning over to somebody else? Yeah, on some of the instrumentation we've developed, and I agree with you on the patents. But uh, and uh, you know, I'm just maybe I'm asking the question. But once somebody's got a hold of that, that information can go to a non-covered country and you know that was my concern about doing that yeah well and the other thing is is that you got to be careful if if you have um your devices or your technology that is not covered by patents and and maybe held is trade secrets those are those are things that you don't necessarily want to turn over to the other side um, and, you know, because that's part of your secret sauce so that if, if the other company does acquire you, fine, you turn it all over, um, or, or, but, but if they are just doing a deal, they may not need to see your secret sauce, um, mm -hmm. in order to do that deal. Um, uh, so there, there, it, it can be highly fact specific on, on that kind of a thing. Um, okay. Steve Ottersberg. Can any of the panel members comment on best practices or pitfalls of a nonprofit research institute licensing IP for a profit organization for commercialization? Kyle, is that something that you've ever worked on before? 
That is uh, what I do every day, actually. <clears throat> you know, ASU is a nonprofit institution. We also assist some other nonprofit research institutions. And day in and day out, we're, we're licensing IP to for-profit uh, partners. I would say one of the pitfalls you can run into from the nonprofit side is losing sight of your mission. You know, our mission as a nonprofit research institution is not to maximize revenue like a for-profit company. We don't have shareholders that we are accountable to in terms of making dividends and increasing stock value. Our shareholders are effectively members of the community and citizens of the state of Arizona. That's our mission. So we need to translate technologies. Our, our remit is <clears throat> we do not let technologies developed with, with taxpayer money, you know, federal taxpayer money die on the shelf. That's our mission. So we need to be doing deals that allow us to move technologies into the market, even if it means we might be doing them a little bit differently than trying to maximize revenue. So if if Stefan is negotiating with our office, um, are we going to get hung up over, you know, Stefan wants to pay a royalty of X.5 and we want, you know, X plus 1.5 or are we going to let a deal die because of that kind of difference? No, we, we won't. And so as a nonprofit, I think you have to um, make sure you understand the the rank order of your priorities and make sure you stick to your mission. You don't need to give the farm away. You don't need to be giving your technology away. You should ensure fair return for your organization that pours back into your mission. But just remember, you're not a company that is out there trying to maximize revenue, most likely. And so that should dictate your, your deal negotiating strategy. Excellent. Excellent. And with that, we'll close because we're right at nine o'clock. Joan, you want to jump in? Absolutely. So first of all, Jason, thank you, Kyle, Stefan, Jane. Um, great discussion today and lots that um, our attendees can take away from. Um, in addition, some of you may have noticed that Jason and I have pins on our jack. And if you can see them up close, they are Arizona pins um, for a very simple reason. Um, leaders in Arizona have taken on the goal of doubling the size of our bioscience and health innovation sector by 2033. And what that means is that we all have to focus on how we're developing companies, how we are developing our IP portfolios, how are we looking at funding, and most importantly, how are we working together to achieve that goal. Because when we do, we will have a healthier Arizona, a wealthier Arizona, um, and most importantly, we'll be impacting people's lives around the world. So um, I encourage you all at the next AZ Bio event that you attend to pick up a pin and start wearing it. And if people ask you what it's for, you say we're gonna do it. We are going to double the size of our life science sector by 2033, and we would love for you to get involved, at, just as our panelists did today. So again, thank you everyone for your attendance. Thank you panelists for great ideas. Jason, thank you for your leadership. We'll see you on the next Daisy Bio Peers. Bye-bye. See y'all. Thanks, Joe.